Welcome to This Week in Guns, a podcast that covers the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. Brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network. I'm your host, Chick Challen from Gun Guy Radio. And Brownells helps make this show possible. Selection, service, and satisfaction. Find it all at Brownells. Please visit thisweekinguns.com slash Brownells. Well, this week we have a great panel, uh, starting off with uh, Mike from the Firearms Insider Community. Hey, Jake. How you doing? Great. And uh, Aaron, the wizard of the We Like Shooting podcast <laughs> and website. Yeah, that's me. Thanks for having me. And uh, Steve, the uh, Firearms Radio Network uh, senior law enforcement producer or as it says here, dynamic optimization developer. <laughs> it's actually future dynamic optimization developer, but uh, I couldn't fit all the characters in. That's pretty disruptive. <laughs> well, let's see here. And we have John Chaos, YouTube star. What's up, guys? How are you? And... Uh, awesome. Brand new panelist to uh, This Week in Guns, Adam Peeney from LWRC, uh, Territory Rep. Hey, Adam. Hey, thanks for having me. Really, really excited to be here. So, really? uh, Yeah, Sorry. I'm actually... <laughs> I told John, we were talking about it on, on earlier on his ride home. I'm like, dude, when are we doing live shows? I'm like, I'm so bored. I want to get back to doing that again. And uh, he was like, you ready for this? I'm going to jump in quick. And I was like, okay. So here we are, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, every uh, every Thursday night we do this live. So, so Adam, what's um, what's LWRC? Uh, they got anything in the works coming up here for SHOT Show? Can you leak anything? Uh, I mean, we, we this year, or this past SHOT Show, we released a lot of Title I stuff with our IC rifles, uh, our new 6.8 platform. This year we're going to have uh, some, some different spins on that, some new models, uh, some new short barrels, and it's going to be pretty interesting. The stuff we have, we've shown to a couple dealers, and we've got some real interest gains, so I think the uh, commercial market's really going to be excited about it. Very cool. I don't re recall from last year, do you guys participate in Media Day at the range? Uh, we didn't last year. I don't know if we are this year. I'm a, uh, I'm a small wheel in that cog, and I usually won't know until my feet are on the ground in Vegas, so... Very cool. And uh, John, uh, I guess you have a big giveaway going on. Yeah, I have uh, the full kit giveaway going on, I'm trying to get to 15,000 likes on Facebook, and it includes an absolutely awesome amount of gear, giving away an Engage Armament AR-15, kind of a three-gun style setup, a bunch of tactical gear, HSGI, Ares Armor, uh, training from uh, M3 Strategies, and that's uh, Stephen Pinot who's behind that. He also donated some ammo, have a cert pistol, um, and a bunch of other gear. And you can check that out on facebook.com slash chaos311clarity. Please go enter that, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be giving that away before the year is up. Very cool. Or uh, whenever you hit 15,000 likes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, let's get into the main stories for this evening, and we're starting off with Glock. So apparently a Glock uh, 41, that's right, 4-1, is confirmed because um, a website, I lost a web, Sportsman's Depot, uh, mistakenly put it up on their website for sale. And apparently you can even pre-order it, and um, they're saying it's a 45 ACP. Gen 4, 13 round block. Uh, but that that's really all it says. It, you know, it gives the uh, SQ number and everything. Does, uh, was anyone um, able to f read exactly you know, the dimensions of this uh, new Glock 41? Uh, no, I, I haven't seen anything on it. It, it says up at the top, it says 5.3, so I would assume it's a long slide gun, just like their 34s and 35s. You gotta wonder why they waited so long to bring something like that to market. You know, the the long slide guns have been popular for ages. You, it, I I wonder if perhaps the success of the XDM long slides was kind of the catalyst behind that. Yeah, I mean those XDM. What were they? The five uh, five point, and a quarter. Five and a quarter. Yeah, those are seem to be huge and. Uh, 
Now, now, so Glock already has long slide versions of a you know nine forty. 357 SIG, correct? No, they did not do the 357 SIG. They did not. Okay. So just just the 9 and the 40 then? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So 45 is the third version of that. Well, and they're seeing other companies start to do long slides. I mean, even the new, they, I, I don't think they're out in 45, but even if you look at Walther, their new, uh, I forget what they're called, the, PP- the PPQ. PPQ. Yeah, even, at least a 9 and 40, even they have long slides. So, I mean, everyone's doing it. Who else? Is it SIG or a, another company released a polymer long slide in the last year or two? Um, I think they premiered it at last SHOT Show as well. But uh, It's hard com- to keep up. <laughs> yeah, a lot of companies are coming to the forefront with these long slides, but there's also rumors that there's not just one new Glock uh, premiering, but there's possibly three. The the what 41, 42, and 43 is that the right order? If you I, count I, them from one to you know, if you're counting <laughs> up, then yes. No, no, no. no. I, I, I'm, I'm I wrong. Was, uh, it, I thought it, it was some 40, 41, and mm-hmm. 42. You're right, Adam. It was a 40, 41, 42, and people are speculating that the 42 will be Glock's first 380 pistol. Yeah, in the uh, U.S. market, at least. Well, yeah, I, mean, yeah, would, yeah, I would correct. see that for sure. It's something they've talked about for years, and they've had 380s in their lines before, but the biggest thing is they couldn't be imported. So with all the new USA-made guns, I mean, it's definitely a viable option. It's and, funny because so many people wanted the... Uh, the, what is, I, I don't know the number of it, but the current Glock 380 that you can get overseas, but Glock's mentality behind it makes perfect sense. They say it's the same size as a 19 and a 17. Why would you want an underpowered gun? Absolutely, yeah. I agree with you. Exactly, and I guess the speculation is that this uh, 42, which will be a 380 most likely, will be a single stack, so it would be more in line of like they're, I, I guess maybe the closer to the dimensions of their single stack 45, probably even slimmer. I wonder how many rounds it will eventually hold in that configuration. I want, I'm, I'm uh, mostly concerned about it being. Well, I guess that kind of goes along with your question about it being single stack or double stack. You know, if they're gonna kind of stagger it to fit some more rounds in there, or if they're just gonna, you know, kind of fall in line with. The Ruger, uh, what is it, LCPs and stuff like that. You know, are they going down that road? Well, they've. You would think if they're finally bringing that to market, they would bring it to market for the size of it, and you know, to get it skinnier and smaller. Um, not really concerned about capacity, but get it skinnier and smaller by doing a single stack. But yeah, that's. I guess that's anyone's but, guess you at know, this point. Glock is not one for always doing things the way we think they should do them, that's for sure. True. I had an interesting conversation with a Glock rep years ago, and uh, they they were like, gas and Glock is all about simplicity. That's why, you know, in the 40 calibers, all three guns will take the same mag. You know, they're all built off the same frame because it's simple, it's easy to produce, and it's consistent. So for them to go outside that mold, I don't know if it'll happen, but you never know. I mean, they do have a lot of variations, though, and and they seem to be maybe straying into uh, some different things uh, in in the later years. But but you're right; they are very consistent and being the the same. I mean, they. I mean, they, uh, we're at the gen generation four, but really, it's not all that much different from the generation one. Yeah, it, it's always been minimal changes across the board, you know, tweaks in, in texture and perhaps a little bit in grip shape and things like that. The interesting thing that I, I find is if you handle a Gen 1 Glock and then immediately handle a Gen 4, they feel like completely different firearms. You know, it, they, they feel a lot more significantly different than they appear. I've never been a huge fan of Glock, so you know, to me, this announcement's like, eh, that's great. Well, maybe, maybe uh, this one or perk, perk you up, uh, Aaron. The uh, first Glock Seven from uh, was that from Die Hard? 
the porcelain one. <laughs> the porcelain, yeah. <laughs> Don't you know what this is? <laughs> um, so this is the first, uh, apparently the first 100% 3D printed uh, Glock. I, and it's definitely 100% 3D printed because even the uh, even the uh, bullets uh, and you know projectiles, the cases, they're all 3D printed plastic as well. So it's obviously it's something that could never fire, but um, interesting nonetheless. I guess this showed up on Reddit last week. You know, it's it's an interesting uh, concept for sure. It's definitely you can take it apart and see how things work. You know, like uh, it'd be really easy, just reverse engineering wise. It's a really creative idea. Well, does it does it operate, or I mean, as far as does the slide move, or is that just the way it was printed with the slide open with a round in the chamber like that? It looks like a separate piece, according to the picture. I can't definitively say one way or the other. But um, yeah, it looks. It looks. I mean, even the um, even the uh, the magazine looks like it. it it's it can load. You know, it, it does. All, there's cities and municipalities, and even Congress are going crazy about you know how we have to ban these 3D printed guns and stuff. And so, like even something like this, most likely will be a ban um, uh, under some of the new laws, um, even though it's completely unoperational. Um, this one doesn't well, have Glock sights on it. <laughs> so, you know, my my thought is, you know, once this three D printing technology gets a little farther down the road and it becomes affordable, where like that printer sitting behind me could be an affordable three D printer, where I could, let's say, I buy a new gun and I want a training version of that pistol, well, I could, you know, print out a my own polymer trainer, you know? The game I, is changing, for sure. You know, yeah. I mean, there's so many possibilities, um, you know, in just a few years. Yeah, this this will follow every other track that technology follows. The first one is big, expensive, and cumbersome, just like the first computer was. And, you know, 5, 10, 15 <clears> years down the line, they're going to have ones that you can get at Staples for $100 to print whatever you want. I mean, it's we're eventually moving that way. How they're going to regulate what you can and can't print with that is going to open a whole new can of worms or Pandora's box or whatever you want to well, call and, it. But. And Congress, I mean, in anything doing with technology, they're always at least a couple years behind, if not a decade behind. At the least technology. a decade behind. And, and you know, the, the phone I carry every day in my pocket now is more powerful than a laptop that I had, what, four years ago? You know? Yeah, I can I can do more on this phone than I could on that four year old laptop. So we're yeah we're going to get to the point where I mean maybe even some of this technology would be integrated into the gun where we have that uh, that gun from uh, Aliens with the countdown ticker on the side. <laughs> yeah, I mean how long have we had um, computers and removable media for computers and the Supreme Court and courts are just now ruling on what you would consider old school language for Fourth Amendment and uh, you know search warrants and all that stuff that, that I see with work. Um, it, it just it, it, we're like 30 years down the line for Supreme Court to ever rule on anything associated with this. You know, I think one of the most interesting points about the 3D printed stuff is it opens a completely different market. You open up open source guns to the public. I mean that that creative body takes takes it away from the the companies that are out there spending millions on R and D, and you can put it in somebody's garage, and they could come up with one of the most impressive firearm designs that that we've seen. I mean, we could the the three D printed thing could be the gateway to the next John Browning. Yeah, I also see it as also a nice leap in technology in the sense of, and I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I carry a Stoger Cougar, and you know it's it's a nice gun, it's reliable, but it doesn't come with rails on it, so I can't put a light on it. But if I 3D printed out um, my gun or a, a shell of my my firearm and just slipped it over my current one, I could I could build rails on it. I can change the color of it. 
I can I can change features. I can build you know do print out my own grips. Are you gonna bejewel it like a phone back in the nineties? You think <laughs> I already haven't? <laughs> it's beautiful. No, the only thing I ever worry about is the nefarious use of it. Because no matter how many positives we always talk about, there's always going to be negative sides. You know, when printers get down to be that price, you know, people that can't buy guns if they have the technology to do it. You know, they're not going to use it for good things. So you you got to look at both sides of that coin. I am all about advancements, and you're going to see a lot of good stuff come out of it. But you got to be careful about who gets them. Yeah, but those same people are going to be buying guns anyways. They're going to be buying the the cheapest guns out there. The you know the uh, what's cheaper than the one you make at home? <clears throat> well, that you gotta you gotta afford the printer. You gotta afford the you know whatever plastic that goes in there. Or I can get a you know a. Uh, uh, you also be smart enough to use it too. You know, I can get a, a ninety dollar or one hundred and fifty. Let, let's say two hundred dollars because it's on the street, mm -hmm. high point, or some other firearm like that from my buddy. That's probably not going to work anyways. But I mean, I, I agree with you that the the nefarious use of these. This is going to change a lot of security um, postures for everything from airports to courthouses because you know traditional metal detectors may not detect a completely polymer like barrel ammo everything firearm which we're not too far from that I don't think with advances in technology but just like everything else security postures will adjust to catch this stuff and we'll just keep moving forward well see another thing too is I don't I don't think that you know if, if it became easy enough to to do something like Jake was saying you know go to go to Best Buy buy your printer and and get it done if it eventually came to that point, I mean, the fact remains that if, if there's money to be made, people are going to make money. And I think what it would boil down to is, you know, like if we look at the advancement in the music industry and, and iTunes, you know, even though music is pirated, you know, what they're, they're still making money off their music. You know, people have to go and, and buy it, even, even a digital copy of it. So I think that one of the things that might cost the most money are, you know, the CAD files and having to pay for those and just in, in order to, just to get the the program to do it, you're going to have to you're going to have to shell out some money just for that. It definitely opens up a whole different line of capitalism that is not currently in place in the firearms industry. Right. You know, like paying for rights of software and and things like that that just don't currently exist. Right, I like the iTunes uh, analogy, Mike, because yeah, that's great. You know, when that when you know Napster and all that happened, you know they they the music industry clamped down and put DMRC or what do you call it, DM the digital rights management and everything, DRM, DM, DRM <laughs> on everything. You know, they put that on everything, and the last few years they have removed that from most everything, and oh, lo and behold their sales or profits have gone up since they removed it because things are more shareable. You know, even though they're Spotify and Pandora, their, their profits are starting to tick back up now because you know, the, the, they're, they're listening to the market now instead of trying to clamp down a, a, and restrict the market. And so, I, like you said, Mike, CAD files or stuff like that, you know, they, they're just going to have to, I mean, this may be years and years down the road, but they're just going to have to adjust to the, the market. Well, yeah, I mean, the average Joe is not going to be able to get a hold of those files just by calling up his buddy and saying, hey, can you can you email me, you know, can you can you put those in Dropbox and get those over to me? Right. Can you put those yeah. in the transporter and get those over to me? I think one of the most interesting things that is going to change the industry beyond 3D printed guns is changes in ammunition. I mean, right now we're using fairly antiquated technology. You know, it's still the same old smokeless powder, still the same kind of primers at the core of them, and, uh, you know, brass-cased ammunition. I mean, once once we're able to break away from that and, and change the, the status quo on the way ammunition is produced, I mean, that is when we will really see a, a quote-unquote revolution in the firearms industry. And yeah. it, perhaps it will come at the same time. I, I don't ever see that happening, you know, just because the market is so strong. You know, it'd have to be something 
extremely revolutionary for everyone to, to shift gears because we all own those antiquated guns that shoot those antiquated bullets. You know, it's gonna well, have to be it's gonna have to be universally go backwards and forwards. Well, let's uh, shift gears and go to uh, this story. PCP uh, ammo is now beta testing polymer cased ammunition. So this may be a little bit more in that direction. Where, like you said, Aaron, it's kind of serving both functions. It's, it does, uh, but the problem is, you know, I collect my brass when I'm done shooting so I can reload it. Can you reload this? You can 3D print this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's true, <laughs> but you still have to. But you know, it still looks like it has a, a metal base to it. If, yeah, it yeah, doesn't have a brass base to hold that. a pressure. Yeah, yeah, and that's one of the things with the the 3D pistol. You know, I, I don't think they're going to have polymer strong enough to hold chamber pressures, so they're still going to have to use metal on it. But the 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 PCP ammo it looks interesting, but is it going to give me as a precision shooter the benefits that brass does? You know, when I fire you know a cartridge in my gun. Brass swells out and forms to the chamber walls. They're giving me more room to reload and to push pressure a little bit more. I don't think you're going to get that with plastic. You're not going to, and if you can reload it, I don't think you're going to get the same amount of reloads that you would with brass. Yeah. Well, I, I think All it's right. going to be a different market that they're going after, though. They're not going to go after precision shooters knowing that. I think they're going to go after the guys that want to buy a cheap box of ammo and go out and shoot their gun, the same guys that buy the aluminum case, the steel case. Um, all that stuff, and I think you know the guys that don't care about reloading or range ammo that somebody needs to qualify with or, or whatever. I, I think I think there's a market segment for it. It's not going to be for everyone, but I think there's a real possibility that it, it could work for a certain segment of the market. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely not the first time this stuff has been around. I I remember the first time I ever saw it was on the ground at uh, at a range I used to belong to. I looked down and I said, "What in the world is this?" It was a two two three case with a brass base and a, a polymer. Uh, I guess the majority of the casing was made out of polymer, and you know the the idea behind it to bring down cost is is cool. Is it going to uh, is it going to be a, as good as we all hope? That's kind of untested, but I think this this is kind of pointed at the people that don't want to reload, like you were saying, and or either don't want to or can't, and you know they still want good quality ammunition. Like the one in the picture is a 175 grain Sierra Match King 308. As far as I'm concerned, that's intended to be precision ammo. Right. And you know, and if, could if just they be a can mock up though. You know, well, I mean, if if they can produce decently accurate ammunition with these polymer cases, because there's, you know, we're seeing like the middle section is a different color polymer than the the next section. Well, if they're able to produce, you know, consistent accuracy out of that for a reasonable price, that's a game changer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but what what is a reasonable price? What do, what would you consider? Because you know, you can get some wolf ammo for like, you know. Yeah, but you can't get wolf ammo with 175 grain Sierra Match Kings in it. You can with the Hornady Steel Match. Oh, boom. Okay, well, what's <laughs> what does that go for? You know, that's, uh, I'm sure they've looked at this. Yeah, I mean, it's still you know, probably 75 cents a round. So, I mean, it'd have to be you know, really, really price conscious to, to, to make a dent in the market. Because there's going to be a lot of people that are like, well, I just don't trust that polymer stuff. I'm going to stick right. with what I know. Well, people I mean, are like out the guns right now too, polymer guns. I just don't trust them, you know. I mean, look how long it's taken for steel to really pick up. I mean, steel was cheap for the longest time. The guys were like, oh, "It's going to hurt my gun. I'm not putting it through there. It's not going to give me the same performance." And now we know it's like you know, steel shoots good. It works. It goes off every time. I'd love to see this take off, but it needs to, you know, needs to be affordable and it also needs to perform well. And yeah, I, I think they also need to come swinging with the amount of ammunition that they produce. You know, if if they come into the market with uh, a weak showing, like a hundred thousand rounds, that's not going to go anywhere. They no. need to come out with several million all at the same time. Otherwise, nobody is going to care. It's going to be a flash in the pan, and that's that. Well, you know what? The, another issue too is, uh, you know, you get a round that goes through your gun and it blows up on you. It, it, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a traditional bullet, people chalk those up as you know just a bad bad batch, but if it's one of these things, it's going to be like, everyone's going to be talking about that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You mean like how Glock pistols blow up all the time? <laughs> I 
I don't know much about Glock, so I'll just say, yeah, man, Glock's. Well, suck. it's it's going to be the same thing that you know one one gun is going to blow up because every ammo company out there has blown guns up, and it's going to travel around that it's the polymer case ammo, just like it was the polymer lower on their AR-15 and the polymer Glock and all that. They're going to try to find something to blame that uh, is unfamiliar and different. Right, exactly, and that, you know, and that that's that's unfortunate for a new technology. But, you know, if it's accurate, I don't know if this stuff can shoot sub. You know, some MOA. It'd be interesting at, at distance. You know, well, what, maybe what, uh, maybe me and Peeny will have to get some and try it out. What do you think, Peeny? Yeah, I'm actually looking. At it. I'm trying to see how I can get it tested because I'll spin up a 308 barrel to try it. All right, and then send one to me with the rifle behind it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, that's my baby. John knows that's my baby. Well, I would love to see that. I would like to see what this stuff can do and if it's actually... And I'm sure, you know, it's going to fire, or at least hopefully it's going to fire. But how how accurate, how well? Is it just plinking ammo? You know, I buy boxes of just, just cheap ammo just for two reasons. One, I like to have ammo around, just, you know, home security ammo. And two, I just like to, to fire off a couple hundred rounds when I go to, the, when I go to you know, the range on, on just monkeying around with the gun. I think if they can come to market with uh, a solid two two three showing, say like three hundred dollars a case for a thousand rounds, then it's going to do well. But we well, shall see. Speaking of uh, products coming to market that the public is wary of, Caracal, Caracal, how do you say it? Caracal. Caracal uh, expands their firearms line to include a precision rifle, and they're also releasing their new uh, models of uh, pistols, 9mm uh, compact and full-size pistols. If you recall, the Car Caracal, um, what is it, F and C were recalled earlier this year, um, all of them. So you couldn't... I, I guess you can't buy them still. They're still off the store shelves. And um, they're, I, I, I'm guessing they're going to debut, debut these new ones at the SHOT Show, but uh, they're also debuting uh, a new precision sniper rifle that's going to be initially offered in 7.62 and then also imported in 3.38 Lapua and uh, 300 Win Mag. Ooh. I'm uh, I'm kind of excited about that that uh, bolt gun. That looks yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah, what I understand about that bolt gun is it's also going to be a switch barrel system. So you're going to be able to buy the platform, then buy bolts and barrels with it. So you have one gun that can shoot a multitude of calibers, which is generally where the precision market's going nowadays. Guys want the most bang for their buck, and if they can get a gun that shoots you know, three or four different calibers, it's worthwhile. And, and just looking at the video, it looks like a pretty solid system. You know, it's very simple. It's nothing groundbreaking. It's got a detachable box, ma box magazine system. You know, it looks like a three-way adjustable rear stock with, you know, cheek height, you know, comb adjustments and everything. So it looks like a solid system. It's just going to come down to how well it shoots yeah. and the price that it's offered in. You know, if they bring in... They... What's Go up? ahead, sorry. No, no, you're good. Um, if they bring it in the, into the market for, you know, in that value for around 2500 to 3000 yeah, they'll, they'll do pretty well with it. Uh, I think that anyone that follows the market will know the history of Caracol and wonder, shouldn't they fix one thing before they move on to another? Um, you know, if, if they're still keeping people's guns, like I know, obviously the XDs are still having a problem there too. Um, but I don't know. I, I think they should. Uh, it's just bad timing, I think. If they haven't cleaned up one mess, they shouldn't start a whole new one. But well, it seems like they're essentially relaunching their entire brand here at SHOT Show with all new pistols and this new rifle. I think that's exciting. You know, they, they acknowledged that they made a mistake, and they, they definitely got the word out very quickly, and they seem to handle the situation way better than companies like Springfield have been handling it. So I, I think... I think I'm one of the per one of the, the the people that's going to give them a shot. I'm going to go there, check them out, and and see because I went to their booth last year and I really liked the way their guns, uh, you know, kind of handled and I thought they were neat. But it was an unfortunate circumstance. 
will will some of them break? We shall see. We shall see if they will stand up. How did they handle the issue? Uh, I know. I mean, did they give people refunds? Have they provided replacements yet? It was, where it was they actually on that? pretty impressive. You know, just from a manufacturing standpoint, to actually man up and be like, "Listen, you know, there's a problem with all these guns. It's our fault. It's not yours." They took guns back. They issued refunds, and they did everything. I know a couple guys who had them. And they're like, you know, they beat down my doors to get these pistols back. You know, yep. which speaks volumes. That's huge. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a manufacturer coming out of the UAE. I mean, they're their culture it really prides themselves on good products and what they put out. So I wouldn't have a problem, you know, shooting their handguns in the future and stuff like that because I know that they're going to bring it back, fix the problems, and relaunch a product that's fixed them and probably better than what was previously on the market. And what's really funny is that we're we're kind of supporting this company after one of the largest recalls in recent memory, and and it's all because of the way they handled it. Right. I don't ever think there's been a manufacturer that's done a full recall on every firearm they've ever made. So, I mean, that, that like I said, that took a lot of brass, and I so, have to respect them for that. Yeah. Some may say there should have been, but... <laughs> Didn't <laughs> yeah. they almost go bankrupt? Yeah, I think so. It was pretty close to it, but... I would bet somebody got fired. <laughs> Just one person? <laughs> In that country, I'm sure they got... Uh, they were standing... Yeah. You Fire. recalled all our guns? <laughs> Wait, all of them? <laughs> Go to the top of the Burj Dubai and jump. Yes. <laughs> all right, well, maybe you can check out, if you're lacking a Caracal right now, you can check out the cheapest handgun in America, the Cobra <laughs> CA380. <laughs> Cobra. This there you go. <laughs> this reminds me of that bad uh, St Sylvester Stallone movie called Cobra. Oh, come on. That's a great movie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say that movie's fantastic. <laughs> oh, wow. What an awful looking pistol that is. It's, like only, a... it's only $103.95. So Thanks. this thing is the new high point? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, why you got to bang on High Point like that? Well, the High Point was currently, you know, they they had the vibe for being the cheapest. Oh no, they are, and they're like a brick. But this thing looks tiny and awful. It, I, <laughs> well, I it's couldn't even keep reading the review because he first talked about. Um, I'm losing your mic. Oh, good. I thought it was me. I'm like, yeah. yeah. I'll just sit. I'll just sit here and pretend I can hear him. <laughs> can't hear. Can't hear your mic. What's going on? Did your, you your mixer me? crap out? You can't hear me? No, your volume dipped down. So why don't you check out, see what's going on. Um, the cheapest, so this cheapest handgun, um, he opens the reviewer. This is on the Truth About Guns. Um, Jeremy S. over there, he uh, it, it opens it up. And it, right away it's got these metal shavings all over it. So it's... <laughs> It's like they, they milled out the parts and slapped it together and didn't even blow the metal shavings off. I mean, that, takes, me a, that takes a lot of time and effort. Yeah, <laughs> compressed air is expensive, guys. <laughs> Human breath is expensive. <laughs> yeah, Mike, go ahead. I think we got you again. You can't hear me? Okay. Yeah. I, I, was, I was just saying I, I gave up on the review, um, not because of the review. The review was good, but... Man, I, I couldn't make it until, you know, to the point where he actually shot the gun. I stopped before he got to that point. Well, thanks right. for doing your homework for the show. <laughs> that thing reminds me You're... of, like, the Jennings 22s and stuff. Yeah. like It, lo I, it looks like a knuckle buster. Like, so it's a, it, it's a blowback design similar to the high point, and I guess it's really heavy. But he did take it to the range, and it actually shot. Fairly straight, he uh, says, and it 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 didn't run flawlessly, but did not break either. It, it <laughs> ran. So that's it, good enough, right? <laughs> yeah, it ran through. Um, I don't know. It was 100, 106 rounds, and he had about six stoppages, zero breakages. Um, Just so you guys know, really crappy guns I have a soft spot in my heart. I I really love them. One, a Lorsen actually saved my life because the guy that shot it at me only got one round off. So 
I, I have a special place in my heart for these guns, so don't <laughs> knock it too hard, really. <laughs> I'm literally having flashbacks of working in the gun shop, guys bringing you know, Cobras and Morrisons, and like, what can I get for this? And I'm like, I will pay you to leave. <laughs> 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 Boo. <laughs> uh, John, you know the feeling just as well as I do. What, of having a, a loaded Jennings 22 pointed at your chest? Exactly. Hey, what can I get for this on trade? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm especially impressed with the machining in the chamber area, which looks like uh, somebody just went, oh, that's good enough. <laughs> what do you expect for $103? Yeah, I like I like how smooth the feed ramp is. Yeah, I was looking at that. It looks brutal. Is yeah, that metal shavings, like... or did somebody take a screwdriver and a hammer to it? Well, yeah. I, I like this part. He says, my second point of concern came when I looked at the slide. Are those hairline cracks? I have no idea. I just decided to operate on the assumption that those are features. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrifying. I mean, I understand trying to come out with a cheap gun, but uh, good lord with the quality. Yeah. Yeah. If if you're gonna do something, do it well. If you're gonna make a cheap gun, make a cheap gun well. You know, it's it's. Uh, uh, come on, guys. You know. Yeah, I mean, at least you could have made this slide out of cast iron like High Point does. <laughs> hey, he did put Drop that 100 percent reliable shooting gangster style. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you throw the bullets. Yes, you yeah. throw them down range. Well, he he says um, in his conclusion that he thought it would be far worse, you know, basically far worse than it actually was. So, um, I don't know. I, I, I would definitely try one out and see if it blew up in my hand. But, yeah, uh, yes, because that's what I want to waste my money on, a new hand. Well, I, <laughs> these, I, these four fingers know. only cost me $105, you know. That, that, that's why I'm always requesting interns for the Fire and Radio <laughs> Network. <laughs> we need a mouse clicker. <laughs> that thing is Jake terrible. doesn't have fingers anymore. Yeah, yeah right. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say that I, I have no interest in buying one of these. I don't know if you guys were concerned if I was going to buy one or not. But I don't know, you drop a Giselle trigger in there and... Uh... I'll oh. get one. I'll get one if they make a double-barreled version, but that's it. Yeah, really, really, this needs to be chambered in uh, like 38 Smith and Wesson short or 38 Colt, uh, like an old black powder cartridge. I feel like that's that's the only way to fly on one of these. Oh, I'd go man. for a 42 ACP. <laughs> 30, like 25. 25. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what an awful cartridge. So, uh, yeah, we, we got to have, uh, you know, think about our law enforcement officers like Steve. You know, put the worst possible cartridge in there as possible, the 25 ACP. Yeah, it's yeah, like somebody know, shooting a spitball at you. Yeah, I'm not, <laughs> opposed to, uh, I'm not opposed to doing things like that. You know, when I, was, when I was deployed in the military, I had a big plan that never quite worked out, that we were going to flood the market with uh, mortar launchers that would cause the mortars to explode right there as soon as they got launched. And <laughs> so the people looking at them that were going to use them against forces wouldn't know whether or not this was the good mortars or the bad mortars. And then the problem would just kind of solve itself. But um, it, it's, I was told it violated some status of forces agreement and a couple other things, but I think it was still a legitimate idea. Definitely a viable option. So gun patents set a 35-year record as limits on sales fail. Um, so in the last, since 1977, there's been 6,700, or 6,077 patents issued since then. And just in the last four years, 19% uh, of those have been issued um, with a record of 370 issued last year. So there, there's a lot of gun companies issuing new uh, patents on um, new designs and, uh, and, and you know, I... I I wonder if a lot of this is AR-15 market or if it's just, you know, the industry in general. What do you guys think? Well, I, I wonder how many are actual legitimate patents from the standpoint of, I mean, you can patent anything creative. You know, you can right. get it through process, but how many of them are actually put to use and sell or are put in a product? So I, that would be my only question. 
Yeah, the, the general breakdown, from what I understand, is if you take 100% of all, all of them, cut 50 away for garbage, then take a third of that, that's going to end up in actual use. So it's a very small percentage of what you're going to see because you know, we've been doing guns for a long time and a lot of ideas have already been made and you're just trying to regurgitate it. And I, I know some other companies that are like, okay, well, this is the idea that these guys have, but because of the wording, we can file it this way and get the patent for what we want. So you right. might have patents out there, you know, three of them for the exact same thing. They're just worded differently. So, yes, they're, they're up, but like I said, you're... you're you're going to see such a small percentage of them ever become real usage parts. And I think a lot of it is like, well, I want I want to patent that my safety lever has uh, this design on it, and my safety lever has this design on it. You know what I mean? Like they these companies, uh, they drill down into the specifics, and I think that that kind of uh, inflates these numbers a little bit. I think a lot of it is probably in the AR-15 market. That's mm -hmm. for sure. Absolutely. And, and that Cobra we just saw. I don't think that's patented. I think they just wrote that on a, a you know, a napkin, like a napkin at a diner. Well, you know, I think what it really boils down to is how does it affect the consumer? You know, does it benefit us or it does it hurt us or does it just not make a difference? Because well, if it somebody, doesn't make oh, go somebody's ahead, gotta pay for those patent attorneys. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, I think that's how they spend more money on, on that stuff, but do we really see the end result other than maybe rising cost over time? Probably not. Yeah, yeah. I think that we would see uh, a lot more small companies uh, producing things overseas and taking over the market if this did not exist. Well, you, you know, know the, like we would see. Go ahead. Well, I mean, you you look at um, uh, Magpul. They produce some stuff overseas, and next thing you know, the market's flooded with, with knockoffs. So I don't think, you know, obviously the patents didn't help them at all, their patent protection. It's, you know, I, I think it's, a, it's bad for consumers. If, if, we, if there's competition in a free market, then it makes, it, uh, it makes them have to actually make a, a product that we want to buy versus a product we have to buy. Well, and I think even more so they have to back it um, like you guys mentioned about Caracol earlier, you got to back it with good customer service. You can make the greatest thing in the world, but if your customer service is horrible, it, it's not going to work out well for you. Yep. John, do you think we could patent Bluetooth technology on ARs? Yeah, of course. All right. I think we should look into that next time. Yeah. What are we going to Bluetooth it to? Uh, a cell phone control? I want to know okay. how you're going to get the AR to hang on your ear. <laughs> hey, listen, listen. That's for us to figure out, okay? Yeah, don't infringe on this patent we're working on. <laughs> All right. So Remington lands a forty-seven million dollar contract with the armed forces of the Philippines. Good for them. So uh, currently, the Philippines uses uh, American-made M16s, M4s, CAR-15s, and Philippine-made PV. AR rifles, which are all AR-15 variants, and they also uh, field the uh, H&K G36, the Steyr Aug, and um, some IMI Galil rifles. Um, but it looks like they're moving towards the uh, M4 platform. The uh, Remington-made uh, M4 carbine is currently the most issued rifle in the U.S. Army, so they're I'm going with what works, I guess. Yeah, I think, I think that's good. You're going to see a lot more companies, uh, or a lot more countries worldwide picking up the M16 and M4 platform. And Remington really needed that after going for the uh, the last U.S. contract to where Colt had a real tizzy about it and ended up having the decision reversed to where Colt got awarded the contract as opposed to Remington. So, you, like I said, you're going to see them hunt more internationally and you're going to see a lot of American, you know, M4, M16 manufacturers home for that type of business because you're going to see it worldwide change because it will be the most issued rifle worldwide at one point. Well, it, depend, it still depends though, on whether or not they're a NATO country, right? You know. uh, yeah, I mean, you get a lot with uh, with ITAR regulations and trade embargoes and stuff like that. I mean, they're, generally manufacturers have a list of countries that you can and cannot work with. 
I, I think it's good. You know, I think the more guns a company makes, the more they learn from, and I think in the end, um, all consumers win from it. You know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they'll be able to make cheaper uh, ARs for the consumers because they have so many. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe Philippines has some kind of weird deal that they run their guns through or they learn something and, and they can bring that back and, and change one tiny little part. Maybe they'll patent it. I don't know. But, um, you know, we, we all might win from it. You just never know. I, I think it's great. And now here's a, can, 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 you, can uh, those guns be reimported back in the U.S.? Probably not. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, not if we still have M1 Korans that are stuck in Korea from the 50s. <laughs> right, yeah. American-made guns cannot come back. Yeah. The only well, thing that concerns me about this this particular issue is that Freedom Group is at the helm. And as we've seen, they like to ruin companies like Marlin. And I would like to see them take you know, this $47 million and reinvest it into, you know, what their companies used to be. I mean, look look at right. Bushmaster. What happened to Bushmaster? Well, there has been talk of um, some of the, what, executives at Freedom Group buying that company back and taking it private again. Uh, that, that, was, would be uh, interesting. that was out in the news a few weeks ago. I don't, I'm not sure if we talked about that on uh, This Week in Guns, but uh, that was a rumor. Um, so more stunning gun buyback hypocrisy in Oakland. Oakland, they're not crazy there. I love <laughs> Oakland. Thug life. Hey, they give us lots of things to talk about on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so they had a successful gun buyback program that removed more than 600 firearms from the city streets. That's a lot of high points. Yeah, that's a lot of Cobras, too. <laughs> I love how they say that these came from the streets, even though they came out of people's closets. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we've had that around this area, and yeah, you'd go at these things, and it's literally like guys that were just like, yeah, I found this old junker. I'm just getting rid of it because you're going to give me 200 bucks for a gun that's worth $50. Yeah, yeah I mean... So, and then, go ahead. We play into it, too, as gun buyers because it's like, all right, we'll make some money, but you know, you're also playing to look. Now these guys can claim, oh, we took 600 guns out of violent criminals' hands. You know, so we're, we're as much of the devil as we are the angels in that situation. I think it's always funny when when uh, things happen. Like uh, I think it was a Philly suburb where they turned it into a gun show. These guys went down there and oh, that was in uh, Highland Park, Michigan. Okay, sorry. It's fine. And anyway, these these guys went to a gun buyback and and just started offering people money for these these wonderful wonderful firearms that they were going to give away essentially and get rid of and destroy. Right. Or, or yeah, they we, say they destroy. We covered that a couple of weeks ago, and they they actually bought more guns than the city bought. Yeah, the city ran out of money. <laughs> it was supposed to be like from from 10 a.m. till 4 in the afternoon, and they, they had to close their doors at 11 because they they ran out of money. That's amazing. Yeah, these, these guys are like, we'll buy your guns. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> these guns are obviously not guns in criminals' hands because the criminals aren't going to give them up for a Best Buy gift card or something. They're going to use them to, you know, enforce their uh, crack cocaine ring or whatever. I was going to say, because you can't buy crack at Best Buy. Right. I mean, they're going to use them to, you know, run their drugs or whatever they do. I don't... don't you're not, not a thug, Jake. I'm not a thug. I don't. I'm not, I don't attest to thug life. Uh, Could have fooled me, bro. Yeah, I, you know, I'm. I'm cool like that. But well, uh, traditionally, yeah. it, it's hard to sell a stolen gun. I mean, you, you think it's easy, but you got to find the right buyer. You got to be in the right circles. But if you can go steal a gun and then sell it to you know, the guy in the suit standing there saying, hey, I'll give you $200 for it. I mean, that's a lot of motivation to just go steal guns. So, um, I don't know. I, it, I'm i not a big fan of these gun buybacks. I think it uh, it, it might. I, I'd be curious to see if there's any gun thefts associated, an increase in gun thefts associated with buybacks like these, but um, it, it's all political crap. Well, uh, I, po I posted a uh, link to the picture all blown up so you guys can see it. And is that a bazooka on the table? Yeah, 
Yeah, it kind of looks like it. Doesn't it? It's like, oh. Yeah, I just have one of these in my closet. Too. How much am I going to get for that? Well, and you, I, I don't know if it was this buyback or a different one, but they were offering like 150 or 200 bucks for rifles. And, you know, that would, that would be more uh, than most old, like, single-shot hunting rifles. And, you know, there's a lot of old shotguns and stuff, like, like Sears Roebuck. A lot of these old crappy shotguns that might be beat up just lay, laying in a closet that may only be worth, you know, 75 bucks or something. Mm-hmm. And then people are like, hey, I'll take this piece of junk in and double my money. Well, yeah, you can go to Cabela's and get one of the 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 twenty two caliber crickets. You know, you you can get those bolt action twenty twos that are ninety nine dollars every day, and uh, go make a little bit of money on it. I mean, that <laughs> might be a good investment strategy. That's better than I'll make it in the market any day. Yeah, <laughs> genius. Let's uh, <laughs> let's point out that the the cricket rifles are actually nice for a hundred bucks. <laughs> well, yeah, I, no, I, and that's nothing against cricket rifles. I'm just saying, hey, no, I, I'm, make just, some money. I'm just busting some notes because <laughs> those guys are friends of mine. But no, that's that's it's not the first time something like that has happened. You know, these these people go and and pick up these guns at Cabela's or wherever, and then try to just turn them right around and make money on them. It's ridiculous. Maybe on uh, TLC soon. Flip this gun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know uh, Mr. Peeny will be all over that. <laughs> yeah, I could probably be pretty lucrative with that idea. Yeah. So New York City is reportedly sending out surrender your guns letters. Wow. And uh, they're sending them out for rifles, shotguns, and magazines to either be surrendered or otherwise, re- otherwise removed from the city or modified to hold no more than five rounds of ammunition. So how's this, uh, you know, the question is posed in this article, how does that work for, like, six-shot revolvers and stuff? Oh, you have to turn it in. Yeah. Can yeah. I put Can I put some, uh, like, plumber's putty in the, one of the cylinders? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the, well. So, but the police are exempt from this, right, correct? Of course. Absolutely. It you're, talking right. about the, you're talking about the same people that when they initially wrote that New York Safe Act, they didn't include law enforcement. Yeah, <laughs> I think this is just another uh, more proof that registration is confiscation. That's it. Just proves it right here. You know, yep. mm-hmm. tell us what you got. It's no big deal. Oh, guess what? We need you to turn those in. No, thank you. I, I, this, this sets a precedent. You know, we as uh, Second Amendment supporters need to put a stop to crap like this. This is unreal. I mean, this is a huge infringement on people's rights. <laughs> you were allowed to buy this gun, but we decided that you make us a little bit scared, so you can't have it anymore. That's ridiculous. It, yeah. it, make, it definitely makes you wonder, a story like this, it makes you wonder when someone's going to actually step up and start a revolution, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, here's some of these people that have had, you know, let's say, for example, a, a lever-action rifle that their dad passed down to them or whatever. And Hey, we know it holds, you know, six rounds, which is one more than you can have in something like this or whatever their stupid law says. And we know you haven't broken the law and you're an upstanding citizen. You pay your taxes. But guess what? You still have to turn it in. It, it's just ridiculous to the point that they're getting. And yeah, because, you know, law-abiding is, citizens are, are the ones that... W- are are out there killing people, right? Yeah, how many gang members got one of these letters? I would bet zero. Right. Uh, Nothing like this has ever made any street safer. And I I think we all agree on that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chicago's the perfect example. Take the guns out of the hands of the public and only the criminals will have it. Murder rates just through the roof. Well, did you see that the snippet from the, the article we talked about before? Um, with with the buyback program in Oakland, so the the or, the organization Youth Uprising, um, it like heads this up. Well, here's what it says: Youth Uprising organizers got involved with the buyback, as one out of every five Oakland homicides occurs within a mile of the organization. 
the homicide rate in the community immediately surrounding the organization is seven times higher than the national average, with homicide the leading cause of death for people under 25. So let's not let's not go out and fix the community. Let's remove guns from law-abiding citizens. Let's yeah. do that because that's See, that's way more intelligent and way easier. And what's funny is that San Francisco started a program. I don't know the the very specifics of it, but Department of Justice just rolled out a similar program for prosecutions where they're they're essentially, you know, it's okay, first-time offenders, we're not going to prosecute you. And then, you know, you get enough of those non-prosecutions, and first-time offenders are never offenders because they're always first-time offenders. Well, DOJ said, well, you know, San Francisco has this wonderful program that's saving lots of money because they're not putting people in jail. And, and that's in that whole same area. It's like, well, of course you're not putting people in jail, but look at your crime statistics. Obviously, it's not working. You're saving money on that, but... It's just um, anything that comes out of that state seems to be completely backwards from everything else that, that needs to happen. But remember, they're progressive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seven times progressive, right? Oh. Seven times. So there is a, a map of shootings in New York City that compares shootings to the median household income. And uh, it looks like... Uh, the poor neighborhoods have way more shootings than the rich neighborhoods. Shocking. Yeah, that that's something I would have never believed. Uh, it's pretty interesting. There's a there's a map and there's a there's a marker. The black markers are for fatal shootings, and it says says the blue ones are for shootings that uh, just involve punctures. What is uh, this neighborhood in the center of this map? I don't know New York well enough. Trying to blow up the picture. Here we go. East New York. It's just north of Brooklyn. I don't know what neighborhood that is. Forgive my ignorance, but wow, is that frightening. I mean, that is insane. it looks like you cross one road and then it's just all hell breaks loose. Yeah. Well, what's the one? <laughs> it looks the like top, Detroit. Too. Yeah. And this is a functioning city, unlike Detroit. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. No, it's the Bronx up there. Okay. At the top. But yeah, this is ridiculous. What may what I mean besides having money, what's the difference? Education levels. But you know, obviously money doesn't is not uh, deter people or lack thereof deter people from having uh, access to a firearm. And it's not like the rich people are driving down these poor neighborhoods and just shooting them for school. <laughs> right, right, right. This you area know. just it probably just didn't have a gun buyback yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they just need a NRA gun safety course. Maybe these are all accidental shootings. Yeah, that's <laughs> another good point, though. It doesn't deter or uh, differentiate accidental uh, or and or suicide or you know or right, criminal related. That, that doesn't help their cause. Right. I'm gonna go ahead and guess that that's probably uh, Cobra Firearms' number one customers right there. <laughs> <laughs> just gonna throw that out there. Yeah, it's it's pretty sad is what it it's, is. It's kind of eye-opening to see that there is that heavy of a correlation between poverty levels and violence. Yeah. Well, <laughs> poverty gives you desperation, and desperation gives you violence. You know, so they do walk hand in hand. I think if I was a realtor, I'd have this on my website and say, you don't want to live here, but you do want to live here. Yeah. That, could really, that could kick up property values in those other areas. <laughs> I would like to see this this map overlaid with the people in New York that uh, have concealed carry licenses, like that map that got put out earlier this year. See how many people in these neighborhoods have uh, have licenses. Yeah, but every spot where there's one of the black marks, which is what did they say that that was failed shootings or something? Yeah. <laughs> no, black marks are fatal. Was it fatal? Oh, I thought it was failed, like somebody just, that they shot at somebody but weren't successful. Well, that'd be all the New York police, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't that just happen again with them trying to shoot somebody and they shot two women? Yeah, I think that was a couple, what, two months ago? <laughs> yeah, and I was listening to it today and they're like, yeah, the police are now trying to prosecute the guy they were shooting at for the injured women that they shot. Uh, I'm like, unreal. really, this is absolutely gnarly. 
So um, I have an article here about an incident that took place back in uh, July of 2012 where a, a police sergeant in, um, was this in Texas? For, um, yeah, this was, uh, this was in Texas. Why don't you uh, give us a lowdown on this, Steve? You added this into the show notes. Apparently, this officer uh, was in a shooting, and he uh, had some unexpected help. Yeah, he. Uh, this is at, in in right in the heart of Tex- Texas, right in central Texas, and an officer, a small town officer, went to do an agency assist on an adjoining uh, small town for and, a shooting. And- and sorry to interrupt. And we're talking about this now. The you know the show is this week in guns. <laughs> talking about this now because this information just released. Right. The information just released, and there's a little more <clears throat> at the end of the story too. Um, anyways, this this police officer showed up for an agency assist. It was a shooting in a trailer park. Um, long story short, he was not familiar with the trailer park. He pulled in to what you would consider a fatal funnel was engaged in a gunfight with the uh, with the gunman and a a, um, a resident of the park. I can't remember if he was a concealed carry holder or not, but he he took a oh, what was it a hundred? It was a it was a very long shot with a handgun. <clears throat> yeah, fatally injured the suspect, which well injured the suspect, which gave the officer enough time to. <clears throat> Excuse me, Steve. Enough. Can you can you clarify the hundred? I'm 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 curious 100, about that because you never said a hundred what. It was well, like hundred inches. Uh, hundred. <laughs> no, I, I found it here. It was a hundred and fifty feet with a three fifty seven Colt Python. Okay, nice. thank you, Jake. So it was a really long shot, um, and he was able to one distract and two, injure the subject enough that the officer was able to fire some fatal shots. And um, so, long story short, the the individual that helped the officer out, obviously, on that day, um, he received several awards for his actions that day in, a, in addition to the governor presenting him with a LaRue tactical AR-15 rifle um, to help him out should he ever ha- have to help anyone else out in the future, which I thought was pretty cool to be presented that by by the governor. Well, the guy shot two dogs too. What a dick! Yeah, he was. He the 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 kind of deeper into the story is that he was upset. the The shooter had shot um, a couple of residents in the trailer park and shot their dogs because the dogs were were peeing out in front of his trailer. So. Yeah, it's not even like a, a a mobile home trailer. It's like a, it's like something. It's like a fifth wheel kind of thing. Right. I'm looking at the uh, the um, the crime scene photos, and uh, yeah, shows his guns or his firearms, his dog, the dead dogs, and his awesome looking trailer, and his nasty bed. Yeah, so I thought you know I I uh, I sent it to Jake. I thought it was pretty cool to see that uh, that an armed citizen helped an officer. I th- I think that sometimes that happens more often than it's reported. Um, but uh, I'm I'm glad to see that. So you, Steve, you put this article in here, right? Okay. Next time you put an article like this in there, you need to at least reduce it down to like one sixteenth of the length. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's why I tried to make the long story short, and I definitely did not do that, but I tried. Well, Steve, what, how would you feel if you were in a firefight and then there was another individual who wasn't an officer? I mean, would you, it's confusing, don't you think? It's it's not the safest thing or the smartest thing for um, an armed citizen to put themselves in, in the middle of a firefight because it can be, you know... No, it just worked out in this situation. I mean, it's um, you, you would hope that the officer that's inspir- experiencing that has enough wits about them during during that incident that they know what's going on. And it, it literally happened that the shooter that the officer was engaged with was right in the middle of that officer and the armed citizen. So... They they actually had almost a direct line of fire with each other, with the subject in between them, um, <laughs> and, and the guy still made the shot enough that. And 
I think what helped in this case is the officer didn't know where the shots were coming from, and he didn't know why the suspect wasn't engaging him anymore. He was engaging somebody behind him, and then he realized that somebody was helping him. So um, I, it, it could have turned bad. I think it could have turned bad, but luckily in this situation it turned out well. Um, you know, you, you just again, you just have to hope, which is we certainly have seen where hope has taken us, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to hope that the officer is smart enough to understand who's good and who's bad in that situation, but, but it's definitely not an ideal situation. So the House Extends Undetectable Firearms Act for another 10 years. So I guess I need to put my 3D printer order on hold. Uh, well, the picture they show has metal on it, so I don't think it that one's undetectable. Is that, yeah. all? Is that it? I have to just put a piece of metal in it? Yeah, technically. Because <laughs> most of them use a nail for a firing pin. I mean, it, it's detectable in a, in a metal detector. That's the whole r rule, isn't it? It has to be detectable. Yeah, if you ever read the book Glock, if you ever read the book Glock, they talk about that when it originally got passed. It was because they were scared of this Glock 17, and they showed that this gun, even though it's polymer, still doesn't fit in these parameters because it's still traceable. It doesn't matter if you use 1% of metal or 100% of metal. It's still traceable and it's still circumvented. So it's a completely useless act. Yeah. I mean, and if, if you were creative enough, and I mean, first of all, anyone can get anything done if they really want to. You know, you print off a gun, you put the nail in your pocket, you put the gun in your briefcase, you walk through the metal detector, and you put the metal pieces in, you know, boom. And then you're, you're, you're you know, now now you, you've circumvented. But who's going to do that? A criminal's going to do that. You know, the, the laws that are, it, uh, honest, and, honest citizens aren't going to be trying to circumvent the law or break the law. And again, you know, you need a substance that's going to be hard enough for, for you to set off the primer. You know, it takes a little bit of force, so you need usually a, a hammer, or excuse me, not a hammer. You need a, um, a, a usually a steel nail or, or something like that to set it off, and there you go, you know, detectable. Worthless. Or you, maybe you could make a 3D printed flintlock, and then you wouldn't need a... <laughs> Hammer. We still, or, we still or, need a flint, though. And when isn't flint when flint? Uh, well, oh no, no. You could just you, you could use a lighter. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's yeah. it's yeah. It's like why waste your time with doing these kind of laws? You know, there's more important things. You know, fix the budget. You know. Yeah, but but this is this is for appearances. Yeah, and they, all they did was change one line from 25 years to 35 years. Right. You know, and they probably worked like six months on that, this bill. You know, well, look what we're doing. We're saving I think every day they got together and go, yeah, we're totally going to change that one day. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> That's all, say, yeah. all right. Home invader gets shot and killed with his own gun after he tries to execute a resident. <laughs> So appar apparently this guy broke in wearing a ski mask into a Ville Platte, uh, Louisiana home on Sunday, and he confronted a, a male visitor in the home and held a gun to his head and demanded money. <laughs> and so either either these people are brave or they didn't like this guy that was visit visiting them because they refused <laughs> Is robbers holding a gun to their their friend's head and they they refuse to give them money, <laughs> and uh, that's uh, that's when uh, the, the suspect tried to execute his hostage, and unfortunately or fortunately not unfortunately, for some reason the gun did not fire, and then at that point uh, details are still fuzzy, but the residents wrestled the gun away from the bad guy and. Uh, got the gun to work again and put several rounds into the bad guy's chest, and he uh, expired on the kitchen floor. See, this proves my point. Keep those crappy guns out there. <laughs> See, well, this 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 story bothers me. Um, let's be a detective here for a second. What if you you know just why I took a gun from you? What are you gonna do? You're gonna stand there? Or you're gonna run away? 
you're going to probably most likely run away. Then how am I going to put two in your chest? You know, it would be in your back. I don't, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, I'm not saying this didn't happen the way they, they're saying it, it happened, but, you know, it's, he said he's dead, you know. The other guy can't really tell. To Aaron CSI Krieger. You can't, well, you can't. Well. You can't the, guy, the guy who's dead can't tell a story, so you know you don't know. But details are still fuzzy. I'm, I would. I'd be interested in following the story to see how it plays out because. Yeah, but you're you're putting too much intelligence on the intruder. This is a guy that thought it would work to break into somebody's home, hold a gun to their head, and get money. Uh, obviously, this guy is not that intelligent. So when he has gun pointed at him. You know, he probably doesn't care. He's not smart enough to figure out that's a bad thing. So he probably, probably thought it wasn't going to work because it didn't when he pulled the trigger. Also, thug life. Uh, I never back down. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it probably went off when they were in a tussle for the gun. That's what I would assume is what happened. You know, he goes for the gun, they grab it, they fight. Two yeah, shots are off, and that's what happens. I, I'm thinking that, though, they, you know, they probably had to clear the chamber. You know. Well, or they took it from them, from him, and they were like, "No, you have to flip off the safety." And then, right. blam, blam. <laughs> Either that, or it was a double single action, and he had decocked it and neglected to pull hard enough. Uh, you know, I, I, or maybe they invited him over, and then they, they just, as a group, they really thought he was kind of a, just a jerk, and they were like, "Let's just get rid of him." So you're saying they don't go to parties in Louisiana? I wouldn't even go to Louisiana. Peter Palma lives in Louisiana. I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough wine to hang out with him. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to. I like to hear the story. I do like the fact that the uh, the person shooting the firearm is a woman, because you can see that her um, fingernail polish. I don't really see what kind of gun it is either, but I'm telling you, if so, if someone wrestles a gun away from me, I'm not going to just stand there. I'm I'm going to take off. Yeah, but so, you're smart. You know the end result. <laughs> <laughs> so, put yourself in that situation though, as the victim. If somebody came in your home, and for me, I would I would think, why why would I why would I just say no? I'm not going to give you money, because if you say, oh okay. You know, you can buy yourself some time, yeah. rather than just saying no. You know, buy yourself a little bit of time. Yeah, and I mean, if that gun didn't malfunction, their friend would have been dead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's my response is going to be, yeah, hold on, let me get my wallet. It's right here in my waistband. <laughs> Boom. Exactly. But you know, yeah, the story it's just very seems difficult. Weird. It's difficult to put yourself in that situation. If you carry in your own house, or you have guns, very handy. Yeah, and then again, I mean, the story could be completely legitimate. It just seems a little odd to me the story the way it's laying out right now. But I, you know, again, I'm not a I'm not a police officer, so uh, I'm not a detective. I just play one right here, right now. It just. Did you, did you stay at a Holiday Inn last night? It only an express. Duh. I think you're still good. <laughs> you're still good. Yeah, just it, it, it's an interesting it's an interesting story. I would like to follow it more and see how it plays out. So the uh, truth about guns had the question of the day: Is camo the new zombie craze? Yes. Yes. For the for the gear guys, absolutely. It, it, the biggest thing is, oh my god, is it going to be multi cam? Is it going to be Marpat? What is it going to be? And you got all these guys that are rushing out to buy gear, and they're like. Okay, Cryptek just hit. I've got to buy everything in that. It's absolutely the new zombie craze. You're going to see it on guns. It's ridiculous. Did you see Multicam came out with new camos? Oh, they're horrible. <laughs> oh, they're so bad. I like Multicam Black. It looks nice. That's, that's the only cool one. And it's really good when you're in you know, Manhattan or Detroit or Oakland. You know, that's where it'll really fit in. I, Let's see. I, what do you mean by them people? <laughs> Sorry. Well, what's even more ridiculous is I, I think the other zombie craze is Duck Dynasty stuff. And and don't get me wrong, I'm a I big fan of Duck I was just going to say that. I'm a huge fan of Duck Dynasty. My kids love to watch it. I think it's a good show that they can watch, and, and I think they focus on the right things. But what I don't agree with is, mm. and maybe they're marketing geniuses, but they literally, like I was looking through the Cabela's ad tonight, they have Duck Dynasty dog treats and Duck Dynasty talking pillows and socks oh, they say? and shoes. I saw those talking pillows at Bass Pro Shops. Unbelievable. I mean, first of all, first of all, they're about three feet 
and it's just like a, a giant head of an old bearded man. Like, why would you want that in your house? How creepy is that? <laughs> you mean you don't want to wake up to Uncle Si staring at you? Yeah. yeah. And then possibly says say I already something have a little mis misleading. <laughs> like happy, happy, happy. Like, ugh, ugh, don't talk to me like that. Yeah, but but John, if you could put your if you could put your little icon on a pillow and sell it, oh, wouldn't, it, wouldn't you do it? Oh, I'm a prostitute. I would sell it all day. <laughs> you I can't mean, blame not, you, I don't blame those guys at all. I blame the people that keep buying that crap. Well, remember Kiss? They made like a, a Kiss casket. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, did they, they really? Oh, yeah. You could buy anything Kiss. They made literally everything with their with their logo on there. You know what I'm surprised we haven't seen is a uh, Duck Dynasty cereal. What would it taste like? We're not far from ducks. There. Ducks, exactly. <laughs> it's obviously, ducks. It's a really greasy cereal, but it's not bad. <laughs> a little gamey. <laughs> they do have. They do have the uh, Duck Dynasty wine. Do they so, really? Oh my mm -hmm. god! It goes well, well with duck. I mean, this kind of takes us into our, our next story here. Uh, the level that Duck Dynasty has. Excelled to because you you know you really you really have reached a level when a robber <laughs> dresses up as a Duck Dynasty character. That's unreal. Uh, so a man wears Duck Dynasty <laughs> disguise during an armed bank robbery in uh, Fifth Third Bank in um, Florida and Ocal. Is that how you say that? What Ocala? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 They're, 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 I don't even know if they're from the south because it's Florida. They don't, they don't count. Sorry. Anyhow, yeah, that's ridiculous. You know what's really ridiculous is the name of that bank, Fifth Third. That's not even mathematically possible. I hate. I yeah. Thank I'm you. Just, Thank you. That. <laughs> um, I'm like I'm here all night. Tip your waitresses. <laughs> I love I, I love how nowadays you, the unfortunate thing is that if you put on a costume that happens to have Long, uh, long hair and a long beard. You, no matter what, you're Duck Dynasty. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. he was wearing a Jesus costume, an old Jesus. Uh, maybe well, he was just trying to be a hobo. Isn't imitation the best form of flattery? So doing a bank robbery has got to be the next level. <laughs> That's uh, it's 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 incredible. We have guys at work that all have beards, and I swear to God, every trade show is like. Do you watch Duck Dynasty? And there's like, please kill me right now. <laughs> yeah, I've never even seen the show, to be honest with you. Is is it any good? Uh, it, if you like that sort of thing, I suppose. It's yeah. highly I, scripted. It's highly scripted, yeah. yes. I, I enjoy it. I, I think it's a good yeah. family show. It's one of the few f shows you can sit down with your wife and kids and watch anymore. Mm -hmm. Young kids. Um yeah. So the Han Solo uh, Star Wars blaster is set to auction for two hundred thousand dollars. I I I s you not. I want. I would have bought it if I had that money. I love that thing. Uh, oh, really? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh you yeah. Absolutely. Me once that thing's so bad. Yeah. Yeah. I would. I would. I would fight you to the death. You can have thing. it, bro. All right. Yeah. I win. Nice. Nice. I'd rather have the just... blaster than the lightsaber. Someone yeah, print real. one. Somebody three D print one. Yeah, I mean, I would take a 3D printed one too, but I, I this thing, I mean, this come is on. original. It's yes. it's um it's still the exact uh, one used in the movies. It's based on a German issued of Mauser C96 pistol. I almost and... bought one of those just because I like this gun. This is what you know. I yes, <laughs> I ended up with the uh, the Keltec PL, uh, PLR16. Which is kind of, you know, the, the bigger That's version the of this. thing, right? Hey, yeah, it's the bigger version. It's like the daddy version of it. But, you know, it, it was like, yeah, this this is the, the, this is the gun right here. All it's I like got to say AK is desperation is the smelly the cologne. <laughs> <laughs> this, you know, just because you have no taste, sir. <laughs> this was the gun, as far as I'm concerned, as a child, Introduced me to all other guns. This was like this was the first one I ever had gun envy for. It was like, wow, that's the coolest gun ever. See, and I'm I would, same, I'm the same way with the Beretta 92 from watching Die Hard. <laughs> I, I would, 
this thing is like seriously though, if I had two hundred grand, I would I would purchase it. But so, uh-huh. so what? what I, I think it's seen better days though. It looks pretty beat up, don't you think? It yeah. does, yeah. But that's what gives it, you know, because of Han Solo, man, he was a uh, he was hardcore. So this this I'm is something that this doesn't have it. that um, a lot of people make replicas of. I mean the the whole you know builders uh, you know uh, genre they, they they like to make replicas of this and like the um what's the other gun um that um I'm having a brain fart now. That's all right. I'll tell you what, <laughs> the handle on it looks a lot better than a Glock, too. By the way. Yeah, it's a broom handle. <laughs> I want to know what happened to it. How did it get so beat up? It's like got tossed around in studios. and It's like 30 years old or something. Well, that's because, you know, whoever owns it now is like, hey, you want to see the Han Solo blaster? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. bet you they jump around their house going, pew, 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 pew. Yeah, in their underwear. <laughs> They're, they're under ruse. Come on, that's, what, under that's what Peeny does with the cert pistol. All day, all day. <laughs> okay. I think it's almost required if you buy it that you have to reenact the bar scene on Tantooine. Oh, <laughs> like I think that's it's you got to have that when you buy the gun. <laughs> it comes in the contract. <laughs> so um, you know, the TSA always releases um, how many guns and stuff they find every week. Uh, and their searches, um, it always pops up on my uh, on my feed. Um, and I, I I thought this was interesting. They found uh, 22 stun guns, and one was disguised as an old cell phone. <laughs> so basically, they popped apart an old cell phone and put a stun gun inside it. I'd be willing to bet that it was a gun show purchased. Yeah. That sounds yeah. like something you would find. Like it, it's clearly not a phone. But it looks like one though. Yeah, so I don't was think it a anyone gun disguised as a phone, or was it just like in a case that looked like a phone? So, so they make these stun yeah. guns to look like phones. I'm sure. They, okay. They also make packs of cigarettes to, uh, or they make stun guns to look like packs of cigarettes too. Oh, well, that'd be a bummer when you get, you know, really need a fix and you reach in there. <laughs> Boop. That's one way to quit. <laughs> yeah, that's how. That's what you get for smoking. <laughs> hey man, can I bum? Can I bum a cigarette? Yeah, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> Negative reinforcement. Or you, or you electrocute yourself when you go to pair your Bluetooth AR-15. It's <laughs> <laughs> no, like, patent uh, infringement now. Now the uh, one of the the funnier ones I thought they found was a real gun that they found wrapped up in a. It was in a cardboard box, but it was wrapped up in tin foil like a baked potato. <laughs> Somebody was trying to get that through. I'm like, is this <laughs> this this one of those guys that yeah, I just wrap it in tin foil. They can't detect it. <laughs> Here, take my helmet. It'll work. <laughs> Genius at work. Those are some ugly looking stun guns too. So, um, do you need a jump start? Don't have cables? AKs to the rescue. There's this video that came up on guns.com that um, shows uh, some guys jump starting uh, this uh, vehicle with uh, the use of some uh, AKs uh, to breach the gap. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Hopefully, it was unloaded. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't blame them. I mean, that's some pretty MacGyver type stuff right there. <laughs> and that just reinforces why AKs are awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. I um reminds me of when I was a little kid. I had a uh, snowmobile, and um, I didn't have enough. Uh, it has a spark plug that was exposed. And I was trying to get the spark plug jammed in there, the the cap on there, so I could start it up. And my brother was there. He's an older brother, full of wit and wisdom. It's like, hold the spark plug and hold this wire here while I pull this cable, and it sh- you should be fine. You, and, and, you know, obviously you, you feel everything when that happens. So I'm really impressed that those guys did not get electrocuted at all, or shocked. 
The story comes out better when you drink more. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's more enjoyable. You'll be like, oh, God, man, that's, well, that's hilarious. I, I, I've been shocked by both, and you get much more of a jolt from a spark plug than you would a battery like this. Yeah, you know, one of the smart things they did, too, is uh, they, it wasn't one guy holding both ends of the AK or holding both AKs at, the, at that time. It was well, one guy on one and another guy on the other. Right. I mean, well, and you're... <laughs> You, you, you draw the short straw if you're holding the positive side, right? <laughs> so who's yes. the one that drew, drew the short straw for using a live cartridge for a fuse? For a fuse? <laughs> huh? You lost <laughs> it? <laughs> I was waiting for it. <laughs> so, you, you never heard of people using 22 for that? Oh, yeah. Now I'm with you. Now I'm with you. Wasn't that on uh, Mythbusters? Yeah, I think so. They did that on Mythbusters? Yeah. So the the these last couple aren't necessarily gun related, but they're they're pretty fascinating. This one especially, the researchers find a lost World War II Japanese mega submarine off the Hawaii coast. That's so amazing. this is a 120 meter long World War II Japanese mega submarine that was. Uh, missing since 1946. Well, it wasn't necessarily mi missing. It was c captured by the U.S. and it was scuttled in 1946. And, and one of the reasons it was scuttled was because we were afraid of the technology and it falling in, into the Russians' hands at the time. But, th I mean, this thing is just amazing. It was capable of launching, I think, three bombers off of it, airplanes, it was a submarine that could had a range of 60,000 kilometers, and then it could surface and launch three bombers off of it. Wow. So were the bombers housed inside of it? Yeah, it had a waterproof hangar inside of it. That's Insane. impressive. That is cool. Yeah, just I mean, amazing. I mean, how, how cool. I, I mean, it's too bad we couldn't. I've kept this around and make it into a museum or something. It's too bad we had to scuttle them, but uh, pretty That's nuts. Crazy. How many did they have? Does it say? Um, I think they had. I think they had more than one. Uh, or, or this was more. There was multiple ships scuttled in this area, I believe. Okay. Or it was along with four other submarines. It doesn't say they were all this huge, I don't think. But this was the largest sub until the 1960s when the nuclear subs came out. So for you know about 20 years, this was the largest one out there. Um, it kind of it kind of shows you how wartime will uh, push engineers. You know, we the United States is not alone in that. In times of need, we have come up with some of the most powerful or innovative things that the world has seen. Gun you buybacks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just um, think it, I think it's flat out amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. I wonder how long it took them to put this thing together. Yeah. Well, definitely towards the end of the war. Because they never used it, from what I understand. Right. Mm -hmm. like how they said they found it. You know, it's been lost since then. It makes me think. You know, when I lose a remote in my house, how hard it is to find it. These guys were <laughs> found an entire submarine. That's impressive in an ocean. Yeah. Well, I wonder if they build it like they build their cars. You can't change the oil filter in that either. It's really <laughs> hard to get to. You have to little tiny hands to get to it. Yeah, that's a that's the real reason it was scuttled. It was unserviceable. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't change the oil in this gigantic submarine, <laughs> so we sunk it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Amazon unveils uh, you know, new ski Amazon. targets. Dot com. Yeah, I saw, <laughs> I saw that Facebook meme. Uh, Amazon unveils uh, flying delivery drones on 60 Minutes. So these are are flying drones that, when I first saw it, I thought they were gas grills. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they look like. It looks like gas grills, and they just put engines on it. 
looks like those mini tents that they put up at like Target and Walmart to show you what the real tents look like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so these, these are drones that it's called Amazon Prime Air, and they're planning to roll it out sometime in 2015, depending on FFA uh, approval. And it, it's uh, supposedly the idea is to have the, the drone deliver your order in roughly 30 minutes after you hit the buy button. Wow, I mean, we're I mean, we were talking earlier about you know the future and how things are changing. I mean, you know, this could be could be something in the future. I, I how do you do returns? <laughs> I'm sure they'll set up something for that. They'll probably put a button in your house and you hit it and they they bring a bot out. I mean, this is the next best thing to a transporter, right? Well, yeah. it's it's going to end up like Skynet. Well, it. It's when they still become a sentient. transporter. Yeah. Well, I'm just waiting for one I can put on my back and fly around town. Because that's what I really want is a jetpack. That's, that that fu- that's what the future promised me. Sell yourself on Amazon. <laughs> you, think <laughs> I, you think I don't? <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a video of this if you want to check it out on the show notes. It's pretty amazing. I mean, um, I... I you know, I would in the beginning. I'm sure it would only be in select metro areas because you know I doubt these have very long range to them. But uh, you know, I was thinking, you know, how cool. You know, you place someday you place an order at Brownells for your AR-15 parts, and you have a drone fly in, drop it off, and you can slap your rifle together the same day. Yeah, you know, the only downside is that you need hubs, you know, for locations. Because even if like if the only location they have is say, we'll just say Florida, it still takes three hours of flight time from Florida to, to you know Detroit. So they would need something close to Detroit to make that thirty minute marker. Yeah, but they're see they're doing that anyways just to do their shipping fast as it is. You probably have a hub close an Amazon hub closer to you than you think. Um, I, I think it's. I watched the. I actually watched the whole sixty minutes episode on it. It's it's pretty cool technology. Was it, was it sixty minutes long? <laughs> it was. It was weird. It was like fifty eight minutes. So yeah, I'm not that's sure ridiculous. where they're getting the sixty from. <laughs> oh my and goodness. they're including the commercials, which I think is is a is complete misrepresentation. But that's a whole other. <laughs> hey, man, Nelson Mandela died today. Just throwing that out there. I know it's not gun news, but. And he's still got less talked about than Paul Walker. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, he didn't drive as fast. Or shift as much. <laughs> okay, any any other unrelated gun news? <laughs> <laughs> My All car's right. making this rattling noise. My giveaway is still awesome. <laughs> All right, well, Brown Owls, who may someday use flying delivery drones, makes the show possible. The leading supplier of firearms, accessories, gun parts, and gunsmithing tools. Find it all at Brown Owls. Please visit thisweekinguns.com slash Brown Owls. And, um, you know, we have lots of great shows on the Firearms Radio Network, but uh, before we get to the pick of the week, I want to point you to... Uh, Gun Girl Radio, who is hosted by Randy Rogers and Julie Gala, both world and national champion shooters. I think between the two of them, they have like 60 or 80 titles. Um, that's a big a, difference, which is it, 60 or 80. <laughs> that's a whole bunch. <laughs> I mean, that's 20 right there. One's you give them 60, you just give me 20. I mean, if we're just throwing numbers out there, I have 40. Yeah, but between the two of them, it's only 10 apiece. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Please continue <laughs> to lie to us. <laughs> but uh, yeah, check it out. GunGirlRadio.com/slash iTunes, and uh, you know they're both. Uh, Julie's the uh, team captain for Team Smith and Wesson, and Randy just recently joined uh, Team Smith and Wesson. So you can check it out. They talked about the uh, IDPA Indoor Nationals on. Uh, Two episodes ago, and uh, good stuff. I'm on Team Wesson, the cooking oil. Well, stuff well, everywhere. Well, spe- speaking of cooking, they actually talked about their favorite 
uh, foods and stuff last episode, whether it's uh, at home or at the range or traveling or, or you know, traveling around the world. They talked about some of the weird stuff they've ate when they're traveling around the world. Oh, mm-hmm. I can imagine. Yeah. I eat some weird stuff just in my neighborhood. But you live in Detroit, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we have Dearborn. How, how does Dearborn's... hobo taste? <laughs> <laughs> On an open flame, a little gamey. But, you know, they season themselves. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Wow. Oh. What, well, with, uh, with... Oh, you laugh because you know it's true. Oh. <laughs> exactly. No, but we have uh, Dearborn right next to us, and I think we discussed this earlier, um, or on a different show. Dearborn is um, basically um, everyone, every, even the, the road signs are written in, in uh, is, is, I want to say Islamic. Is that the correct term there? Arabic, maybe? Arabic. Yeah. Thank you. Arabic. Islamic sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? No. <laughs> okay. Anyhow. <laughs> Arabic. Well, Everything's Arabic. It, so it's one of the it largest. It gives lots of credence to whatever you're about to say. Well, no, it's just they have a lot of <laughs> Middle Eastern food there, and it's uh, there's some unusual unusual foods in the Middle Eastern diet. In but Dearborn? I, Dearborn, yeah. It's basically... Um, you in know, the Middle like, East? <clears throat> it's, it's Dearborn in, in, in De- just outside Detroit, yes. It's healthy. It's good food. Is it I, possible I you... oh, go ahead. to do a Middle Eastern accent without sounding racist? No. <laughs> I would like you to give it a try. I'm not going to do that. You. I was just pro- posing a question. That's all I wanted to do. Oh. Yes, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're to the pick of the week where we choose a product to highlight, a gun, accessory, or gadget. So, Mike, what do you have? Um, mine are the uh, Hygenol uh, field wipes, and they're they're different than like a baby wipe because they're they're, they're you know wipes. it's some huh they're man wipes they're man wipes because not baby yeah, but wipes they're like you know you can throw them in your range bag but they're they're specifically made to to take lead and heavy metals off your hands hmm. uh, um so and there's there's no it, they're not toxic. Um, so, and they're, if you're, if you're concerned about killing germs, they do that too, but I, I, I clean kinda, glasses with them, but they leave smudging or smearing on like range glasses or optical wear that I have on right now. I don't know. I'm not sure. Just um, wondering. yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know that I'd use them on glasses cause they're made for skin, but, uh, yeah, they're, they're just designed to take off lead and other heavy metals, so. It says it cleans toxic dust particles like lead, arsenic, and Uranus. <laughs> ah, <laughs> ah, where is it? Where is it? Uranium. There it is. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I thought it was going to leave it. Um, let's see here. Uh, never mind. I lost myself. Are, are a lot of people using depleted refreshed. uranium? <laughs> is that, is right, that back? back to the wipes. <laughs> uranium oxide. Yeah, is it but depleted uranium oxide? Is that something a lot of us are using? Yeah, you don't use that. <laughs> well, usually <laughs> I use it with, with my, uh, you know, my what is that, tungsten steel uh, shafted bullets, but out of my out of my um, <laughs> tank. Other than that, I'm not using it a lot. All right, Mike, where can you get these uh, hy- hypernol? Hy- hy- <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't even close. <laughs> kind of like uh, hy- hygiene, hygiene all. Yeah, hygiene. <laughs> hygiene all. What's that? A hypno, hypno. What'd you call me? H y g to Dorothy. Yeah, it's it, you pronounce it Dorothy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, I was trying to find a, a place other than Brownells this time to put the link to, um, but the site I what do you have here, against Brownells? Nothing. No, I don't. Shill. I just Shill. it just I was just <laughs> trying to go for a change, but uh, the site that it was linked to um, they didn't have it in stock anymore, so um, they're in Brownells. So the Brownells link is listed here. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a great option, especially if you're shooting with um, the family. 
with kids or whatnot, you want to get, you know, because kids are a lot more prone to touching their eyes and stuff and mouth and mm-hmm. you want to get them cleaned up right away. This will let you do that. Yeah, and yeah. there's there's lead in primers. There's lead on full metal jacket projectiles. Like, you're going to get lead on your hands, whether or not you choose to acknowledge that. You know, yeah. most people don't. They just kind of wash their hands and hope. But yeah. uh, the, the lead removal stuff is, is really good. Uh, I use a, a lot of a product called D-Lead, and it's it's very similar. I'm sure they probably come out of uh, the same composition. But, uh, yeah, I, I think I think it's a wise thing to have in your range bag. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Aaron, what do you have this week? Uh, I have a Streamlight TLR-2 tactical gun-mounted light with laser. It's got a nice green laser on there. And this is the brightest flashlight I've ever owned. You know, I, I have it mounted on my AR in the front. It's a nice toggle switch on the back, so I can, um, with my vertical grip, I can just turn it on and off with my thumb. I have it mounted off to the side. But we lost power here a couple weeks ago. Uh, we had a storm roll through. And I took that flashlight off my firearm, stuck it in the middle of the living room, turned it on, and it was like broad daylight in here. That's how bright it is. It's amazing. Okay, and not, you know, you just never realize the benefits of a good flashlight. Especially a fire a gun mounted one until you have it, and the uh, stream lights are no joke. Yeah, That's and I it. believe uh, they're made in Pennsylvania, not far from me. So high five for that. Woo! What's the uh, price point on that? Uh, you know. That's a good question. I received mine as a, as from the company, so I do not have to purchase it. Oh, so you're just a shill. I am a shill, but ah. you know what? It's it's a it's a it's a, it's a product that uh, I would gladly uh, uh, use for sure. I wouldn't trade Han Solo's gun for it, but I might mount it on it. Honestly, I think the TLR two is like uh, I've seen them anywhere from two hundred fifty to four hundred dollars. I've seen a really, really wide price scale on them. Yeah, I mean, it's. A, it's I don't know a, what the amazing. green one goes for because that's probably a little bit more. But yeah, the only downside is it. Is it um, I mean, the battery life is great, but it takes uh, two of the uh, CR one two three batteries in there versus just the standard one. But it's got the laser going. I mean, it's got strobe on there. It's just a. I I love the thing. If I wasn't married, then I would be shacking up with this thing. That's kind of weird. It, well, you know what? It, it brightens up my life. All right, mo- moving on. Uh, <laughs> Steve, take, take us down a different road. All right, uh, this week I've got the NC Star Golf Ball Launcher. Um, and just to get this out of the way, I'm not a huge fan of NC Star. Uh, they make a lot of crap, uh, just to be quite honest about it. Oh. This, this golf ball launcher is... Uh, if shooting this doesn't put a smile on your face, then nothing will. So I got, I've got i had it actually for about a year. I've never gotten an opportunity to use it. I finally got some blanks in from uh, from two, two, some 223 blanks in from Palmetto State Armory. And uh, I knew this, based on reading reviews, I knew this thing shot golf, golf balls really far. But I didn't realize how really far it was until <laughs> you lose you literally lose sight of the golf ball in the clouds. And I'm fortunate enough that over Thanksgiving I, I went to a friend's farm that's got uh, hundreds and hundreds of acres that we were shooting this thing on and so there was no safety was was, was um, we, we weren't violating any safety rules by shooting it into our neighbor's house or anything. but this will launch a golf ball so dang far. You will giggle like a schoolgirl every time you shoot it off. So um, it's the best, like twenty-five bucks I've ever spent, and uh, the golf balls were free from a friend. And uh, you know, you just got to pay for the uh, the blanks too. But it's well worth the the uh, the expense if you've got a place to actually fire this thing off. At. I've always I don't know if... to play with one of those things, man. They look like so much fun. Oh, you, know, you should awesome. try to do with it, Steve. Go out to your uh, go out to your range and put up a. A horizontal two by four, and set two two three cartridges on top, and try to knock them off with the golf balls. <laughs> so one bounces back at you at high velocity. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna you... say put a shoot and see target out there and just shoot at it. <laughs> just well, big big uh, circles on it. I'll tell you, it's not super accurate if you're aiming it at something, but That's it shocking. will. It, yeah. <laughs> it, will, it will go through tin. It, it will go through the side of a tin barn, actually, yes. <laughs> and, and tell us how you found that out. <laughs> and, 
And um, please be aware, if you're shooting it into a tree line, remember that those golf balls will fire back at you <laughs> and your line of trucks that you're standing by. <laughs> oh. So there's actually a video out there that has not yet been posted to YouTube that has it ricocheting. And it literally it ricocheted at nearly full speed between <laughs> where I was at and where the trucks were parked. So we changed angles at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, man, that thing is a, a whole lot of fun. For twenty five bucks, you can't beat it. Now, Steve, hey, so if you if you want to have some real fun, they make glow in the dark golf balls. Because I've played with that, and we were shooting up at night, and dude, it is so fun to see those things flying through the air. That's a good idea, and uh, when I go back for Christmas, I'm going to buy some. <laughs> when, when, did you shoot that thing without a golf ball in there? Yeah. Is it like a loudener then? Uh, I mean, it's just it's really loud, but it's it's really no more... I, I wouldn't say it's louder than, than just firing off a regular two two three round. Oh, because I thought you could have fun with it outside of the... With, when you run out of golf balls, you just make the all the, the sentient beings in the general area go deaf. Yeah. Now the only the only thing you have to keep in mind is it doesn't have enough um, gas behind it to cycle the action on the AR, so you have to uh, you have to pull the charging handle every time. But that was my next question. Uh, yeah, but I, I will. Um, I. I'm gonna go buy a, a bunch of glow-in-the-dark golf balls, and when I go home for Christmas, I am gonna go out there and shoot them at night because that sounds like a lot of fun. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, during the day, all orange ones work really well. Cool. Just go find a local putt putt and snag a couple. You'll be uh, you'll be in a lot of fun. <laughs> all right. Well, Adam, what do you have for us? Uh, I actually have. Uh, my pick is a Dark Angel medical kit. Um, Dark Angel is uh, a company run by a guy named Kerry Davis, who's a good friend and a, a really, really good dude. Um, he runs a training company as well as the Dark Angel kit. But it comes with uh, it comes in the nice case, which is made by First Spear. Comes with a Cat T tourniquet, trauma shears, gloves, uh, Halo seal. There's actually a nasal airway passage and a quick clot. It's a real good package for about 150 bucks. It's very small. It's only about the size of like two AR mags. Um, I know John's actually giving one of these away from Carry, but it's it's a great deal. They work well, and you know I highly recommend it because it's one thing people don't think about when they go to the range is, you know, if there's an accident, do you have, you know, are you prepared medically to take care of any incidents? Here is uh, the giveaway kit in multicam. Trendy multicam. Now these things are legit. Carrie's a great guy. It's an awesome company, and uh, I mean, I think a lot of guys skip out on medical kits, and it's it's really really important to be prepared for bad things. That's why we all, you know, get into guns and the Second Amendment, and we're prepared for bad things to happen, and this is another way to do so. Yeah, quick quick story on like mine. It really helped me out. I was out in the range and. Uh, Wisconsin doing a demo for some clients, and a, a guy decided it was a good idea to shoot a 45 at a piece of steel in a really odd angle. And I turned my head, and I ended up catching half a ricochet in my in the side of my head, and it bled real bad. But you know, I went over my bag, grabbed the quick clot gauze out of here, and put it on my head, and they were able to stitch me up on site. So it was a, uh, it, it was really good. You know, instincts kicked in, but you know, it's definitely something you should have. You know, even if something is a pack of band aids, some kind of medical kit. Is worth having, and for 150 bucks, you can't go wrong with it. Yeah, St that, stitch you up on? Did they actually put stitches in you? On oh yeah, yeah. I got. I had it's uh, one centimeter from an artery that runs up my face, and an inch from my eye. But yeah, they gave me three stitches on the spot. It was pretty cool. Yeah, oh, that, yeah there's, there's pictures of it on uh, on Instagram. That's refreshing to see that there's legitimate kits out there because there's I've seen kits that just have crap like absolute crap in them and I I've been fortunate enough to be to to have gone through some trainings taught by some very educated people on this specifically and they tell you you know here are the four or five things you need in a kit this is all you don't need any of that other crap and every one of those things that you mentioned was on that list that I have in my head of of what's in my kits um, so it's cool to see that that people are, are making legitimate stuff out there because there's some people that that are um, that are dealing some some really crappy stuff that no one really needs or will use. There's yeah. the ba there's the few basics and and that's definitely them. And I think it's nice also 
Go ahead, Adam. One of the nice things he does is when you take his training class, you know, he gives you a kit at the end of the class. You know, after you take mm-hmm. it, you know how to use everything. You know, and I wanted to put up their website. It's uh, darkangelmedical.com, and you can find a list of all their training classes in your area as well as all the products they offer. Now, did you say there was a, a nasal airway or an oral airway no. in there? Nasal. Oh, okay. Yeah, all, it... these, all these links I have in the show notes if you guys want to check this out, if you're listening or watching. Does that nasal airway have lube with it? Uh, I, I think so. I haven't cracked open this kit, but I'm, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure it does. You okay. got why? You got a date later? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, they do it so it doesn't scratch your septum when it goes down your nose. No, yeah. I meant he was asking about lube. And, uh, you know. You're trying to make a dirty joke out of nothing. I, yeah, well, it was there. You guys just didn't bite into it. <laughs> no, but that's a very important question to ask. Oh, well. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, Moving okay. on. John, what do you, what okay. do you have? Let me, let me grab uh, Project TF, we'll call it, uh, because uh, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> there's great. a curse word involved. Um this is a Trigicon AccuPoint. It's new uh, to their lineup. The, the AccuPoint is a really interesting uh, scope setup. It's got uh, fiber optic built into it. So the center of the reticle is actually lit by ambient light via the fiber optic. Now, this is a 5 to 20 by 50 millimeter objective. And uh, this is something that um, I got specifically for this project. And I'm pretty excited about taking it out and trying it on, on the range. It's so far, you know, I've tested it low light, and it's been absolutely awesome. I'm really excited about it. Super, super clear, easy to use. And Adam and I are actually going to take this out in uh, probably a couple weeks and uh, run it through its paces, and we'll see how she does. But, yeah, definitely check that out, the new 5-20 to 20 by 50 Trigicon AccuPoint. Is that a uh, rear focal plane? or? Uh... That is a second focal plane. Okay. Very cool. Well, yeah. that um, about wraps up this episode. You can send feedback to feedback at thisweekinguns.com. And um, you can also uh, check out the show notes, thisweekinguns.com slash 049 for this episode. And, uh, you know, leave us uh, an iTunes review if you enjoy the show. Uh, really, um, uh, We'd appreciate it if you write up a review uh, and um, put that up on iTunes. And uh, I guess you can also write reviews on Stitcher now. I have not uh, checked that out, but that's what I read. You can write reviews on Stitcher Radio now. Um, So you can check out all the other shows on the Firearms Radio Network. Firearmsradio.tv slash iTunes is our master feed. And don't forget to check out Gun Girl Radio, gungirlradio.com slash iTunes is their feed. And please use uh, our Brownells affiliate link by going to thisweekinguns.com uh, slash Brownells. Well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists again this week. Steve, our uh, senior law enforcement producer, thank you so much. We have uh, an interview or a couple of interviews that you conducted coming up on Gun Guy Radio. The first one releasing uh, this weekend will be uh, with uh, Rob Pincus. What did you talk to Rob about? Uh, we talked about training, uh, primarily the importance of training and uh, Rob's upcoming release of a, uh, of a reality-based training instructor development program that he's starting to roll out. The first, the first training will actually happen uh, the day after SHOT Show ends in Vegas. So uh, pretty good stuff there with, with Rob. And then the uh, second review, uh, you uh, visited Bond Arms. and Yeah, uh, Bond Arms in Granbury, Texas, which is just south, which is southwest of the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex area. I met with Gordon Bond, the president, spent uh, nearly all day with him. And um, they've got some great things going there at Bond Arms. Great, great company. Um, and they definitely love uh, Firearms Radio Network listeners, and stay tuned for that episode so you can hear about uh, what you can do to find out how much they love you guys. So they're, uh, it's a great, great company. C- can't say enough good things about them. Well, thanks, Steve, for all your hard work. Really appreciate it. And uh, Mike at the Firearms Insider Community, what, what do we got going on over there, Mike? 
Well, that's a um, website that is. Um, we got we got a bunch of reviews on firearms and gear. Um, we've got blogs. We have uh, two separate podcasts that are on the Firearms Radio Network, and um, pretty cool stuff. It's a very new website that launched in October. Um, started by Jake Challenge, if you guys know who that is, and uh, just kind of getting things running right now. You know, we're you know working out some kinks and making sure that we're um, constantly striving for excellence and getting good content and good reviews and stuff up. So um, yeah, we we've have, been been having a steady stream of reviews pouring in. Um, yeah, reviews and our blogs are increasing too. Um, so we've got uh, got a few more blogs in the pipeline right now, so those will probably be posted up within the next few days or so, maybe. Um, so yeah, I mean things are rolling along, and you know we really we really push for community involvement. And if if anybody is interested in uh, posting up their own blog or or review, uh, they're more than welcome. You can either email me. Uh, Mike at firearmsinsider.tv, or you can email Jared. Um, you can get he's our senior editor, Jared at firearmsinsider.tv, and um, we can get you get you set up. Love to have you on board. And uh, John, uh, what what do you want to plug? You want to plug your giveaway again? Yeah, yeah, that's three times, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I've got uh, a really big giveaway going on. The full kit giveaway. Head over to my Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash chaos311clarity, and you can enter on there. It's going to be an AR-15, a bunch of tactical gear, and uh, one of the med kits that Adam mentioned, and a bunch of other awesome stuff, including training, a knife, and uh, a cert pistol. It's, it's incredible. And, um, yeah, very fortunate to, to have hooked up with the, the companies that I aligned with for the giveaway, and uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. Well, so, pre- so is it going to look weird if either one of us on the show wins that giveaway? No, not at all. <laughs> Go ahead and <laughs> en- enter, 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 enter. That's all I can say. That, cool. that's, co- that's code for you're not going to win, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Did you tell everybody how to how to enter? It's okay. on the Facebook page. There's a little tab there that says enter the giveaway. And every time I post something about it, I post a little link. Cool. All right, cool. Adam, uh, what, what do you want to plug? Um, well, I always try to plug my Instagram. It's Adam underscore P-I-N-I. But I'll also plug uh, John's giveaway because I'm actually involved in that a little bit. <laughs> if he yep. failed to neglect to talk about it for three times. But no, nah, um, John's giving away a lot of cool stuff. I'm glad to be a, a, a little part of it. And uh, you know, whoever gets that is really going to get hooked up. But you know, follow me on Instagram, Adam underscore P-I-N-I. And I really appreciate you having me because this has been awesome. A lot of fun. Yeah. No, I appreciate you coming on at last minute. It's been great. And uh, Aaron, what's up? <clears throat> Nothing. What's up with you? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can find me on uh, – uh, you can find We Like Shooting on We Like Shooting Podcast on the Firearms Radio Network. Also, you can find our gun reviews and uh, videos at uh, welikeshooting.com. Both sites are uh, really good if you want – the intellectual content, you go to welikeshooting.com. If you want our, our wit and humor, check us out on the Firearms Radio Network, the We Like Shooting podcast. You have intellectual content? We have writers that you that aren't on the air. <laughs> so, yes, we have actually people who, who do a good job. Do a good job. They do a good job. <laughs> yes. We actually we have so, we've been really fortunate. Uh, one of our writers, uh, Nick Rohde, he's um, he's been just kicking butt. And every every single article that he's written, the companies that he the the the, the review that he's done, the companies ask, can we put that on our website? That is amazing. Or, or or that's such a good review. And and Sean gets a lot of his stuff. And and Lil, I mean, there we have a, a great group of people. And, and a lot of their stuff actually gets used by the the uh, the companies because they're so well thought out, well planned, and well written. Cool. Very yeah, not, cool. not my stuff though. My stuff is just like Bleh. you should check out my Wise Food uh, review. It's uh, it's entertaining to say the least. 
Uh, I, I won't go that far, but yeah, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is good. So, well, that wraps it up for this week. Thank you guys so much, and uh, we'll see you next week. See you, Jake. See you guys. Bye-bye. Nazi.